the Nightly Business Report. Good evening. Tonight, a pat on the back from nations world over to Sri Lankan government with renewed hopes of getting back on track with handling the debt crisis. A potential partnership with BRICS bloc is explored as more regional nations brace against turbulence from powerful nations. The Colombo Stock Exchange ends in the red today, causing shakeups in the secondary market. And the Japanese yen takes a tumble as rates fall to the lowest level since 1986. From Studio 24, here's Sina Mayadune. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The efforts of the authorities in Sri Lanka to embark on the necessary reforms for the country's sustainable development path have been commended by the Paris Club, which includes the Sri Lanka Creditors Committee. India and the U.S. ambassadors to Sri Lanka have also expressed their approval of the debt restructuring agreements reached by Sri Lanka yesterday. On the 12th of April 2022, when Sri Lanka announced its inability to repay its debt, the Sri Lankan government had approximately 37 billion US dollars in foreign debt remaining to be paid. Of this, 22.3 billion US dollars was borrowed for projects or programs, while 14.7 billion US dollars was commercial debt. Out of the project or program debt, 11.7 billion US dollars was multilateral debt, while 10.6 billion US dollars was bilateral debt. Among the bilateral debts, 10 billion US dollars has been agreed to be restructured as of yesterday, including 5.8 billion US dollars from 17 countries belonging to the official committee of bilateral creditors and 4.2 billion US dollars owed to China. The total amount of restructured debt represents 27% of the country's total foreign debt. A portion of these restructured debts will benefit from a grace period, and the repayment period for debt installments and interest payments has also been extended. Meanwhile, India has expressed its approval regarding the agreement Sri Lanka reached yesterday for the restructuring of its foreign debt. In a statement, the Indian Ministry of External Affairs mentioned its unwavering commitment to the economic revival, growth and stability of Sri Lanka. Additionally, U.S. Ambassador to Sri Lanka Julie Chung also expressed America's warm welcome of the debt restructuring agreements reached by Sri Lanka in a note on X. She stated in her note that these agreements would help build confidence in the country's financial environment. Furthermore, a statement released by the Paris Club, which includes the official committee of Sri Lanka's creditors, commended the efforts of the Sri Lankan authorities to embark on the necessary reforms for the country's sustainable development plan. Foreign Minister Ali Sabri has said that Sri Lanka has been exploring plans to join BRICS, a bloc of the world's major emerging economies, and a cabinet subcommittee report is expected by end of June. Sri Lanka's move comes as it is now looking for more funding with the conclusion of formal bilateral debt restructuring deal. Sabri, after attending the BRICS Foreign Minister's Conference in Russia early this month, Sri Lanka has appointed a cabinet subcommittee comprising officials from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Treasury, Ministry of Finance and Central Bank to explore the possibility of Sri Lanka joining the BRICS organization. The Foreign Minister told media earlier this month that he sees a lot of momentum being built towards BRICS. As far as they are concerned, they are closely monitoring it. He further stated that based on that, he will go back to the cabinet and depending on what the cabinet decides, they will decide whether to immediately apply to join or to wait and further observe. Government sources said they are still waiting for the report from the cabinet subcommittee. BRICS, an acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, is the world's major emerging economies and the group has now expanded to 15 countries with more nations wanting to join the bloc. Sri Lankan moves also come after two Southeast Asian nations, Malaysia and Thailand, have recently revealed plans to join BRICS, a bloc with middle power countries seeking to maneuver amid growing geopolitical uncertainties, including US-China tensions. Sri Lanka signed the debt treatment deal in Beijing yesterday evening with China Export and Import Bank to restructure 4.2 billion US dollars of debt. 
The framework agreement related to this was signed between Sri Lanka and China in Colombo. This restructuring provides significant debt relief, allowing Sri Lanka to allocate more funds to essential public services and resume concessional financing for critical infrastructure development. Chinese embassy in Colombo confirmed the deal signing, and the Chinese ambassador signed the vital government concessional loan agreement. The embassy posted on social media platform X as great contributions to Sri Lanka debt restructuring. Sri Lanka Bank Associations say politicians are wrongly blaming them, saying defaulters are going free while others are opposing recoveries. Sri Lanka's parliament passed a law to delay Parati execution, a recovery process till December in a sudden state intervention. The SLBA said it was assuring depositors that monies being lent are being recovered and that it is only a small number of borrowers that are resorting to aggressive lobbying to stop. There have been claims made that recoveries are not being pursued against borrowers with political connections. The SLBA said that this is most definitely not the case and any impression being created that banks are lending on personal connections and political influence, that parrot laws are being abused and customers exploited, are misconceived, inaccurate, misleading and unhelpful. In Sri Lanka's most recent currency crisis, which came on top of a coronavirus pandemic, bad loans in the banking system climbed to 13%. The SLBA, which represents all banks licensed by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, including state banks, public listed companies and branch offices of international banks, said in a statement that it was compelled to respond to the remarks attributed to the two ministers in the interest of assuring depositors that their monies are safe and that due process was being strictly followed in lending and recovery of loans from debtors. State Minister for Finance Dr. Ranjit Siyabalapitiya says that measures are being taken to ban the illegal export of metal and iron-related equipment and scrap in the country, and in the future all metal exports should be made only on the recommendations of the Ministry of Industry. This was mentioned in a meeting chaired by the minister. The minister focused on the exchange loss due to the illegal export of all metal waste, iron-related equipment and scrap materials such as copper, brass, aluminum, china chatti, white iron, high carbon and more. This meeting held at the Ministry of Finance in addition to the metal workers, a group of officials representing the ministries of industry and customs participated in this event. The minister said that preparations are being made to issue a gazette announcement related to finding out what are the metal-related exports and identifying the goods in a sustainable condition for export. Accordingly, the ministers emphasized that all illegal re-exports will be prevented and that in the future the re-export of metal and iron-related equipment and scrap materials will be permitted only under the recommendations of the Minister of Industry. The island's Export Development Board said that Sri Lanka's merchandise exports fell 5.81% from a year ago to $960.2 million in May 2024. Goods exports in the five months to May 2024 was $5,016.30 million, up 3.09% from the corresponding period last year. Service exports were up 21.24% in May at $327.35 million. Total goods and services exports fell 0.15% in May to $1,287.59 million. In traditional hard goods exports in May, tea was down 1.1% to $115.4 million. Rubber-based products were up 5.62% to $81.17 million and coconut-based products were up 2.88% to $68.56 million. Other exports that increased included petroleum products which were up 117.68% to $47.65 million and diamonds, gems and jewellery which were up 2.39% to $32.19 million. All other goods exports were down from April. Apparel exports were down 5.37% to $390.29 million and spices and concentrates were down 6.05% to $25.48 million. Time for a short commercial break now. Updates coming right after this from the Colombo stock market. This is the Nightly Business Report.
Welcome back to the Nile Business Report. The Colombo stock market has recorded another day of losses, making today the second day for the week so far to end in the red. Both the All Share Price Index and the S&P SL20 Index recorded losses at the end of today's trading session. To get a breakdown of today's market performance, let's join with Rishit Pereira from SC Securities. Yes, despite the conclusion of bilateral debt restructuring successfully, the indices failed to reflect the anticipated positivity on capital markets. The All Share Price Index closed at 12,188 points, a decline of 72 points, and the S&P SL20 closed at 3,601, a decline of 27 points from the previous trading session. <coughs> the market turnover was recorded at 1.03 billion with a share volume of 41.03 million shares. Sunshine Holdings, Commercial Credit and Finance and Haley's PLC were the largest contributors to the turnover. At National Bank, John Keel's Holdings and LLC Holdings were the major negative contributors to the SPI. Daily crossing volumes included 125,000 shares of Hat National Bank non-voting, 486,913 shares of Sampath Bank and 1,939,700 83 shares of Winforce PLC with a total crossing turnover of 95.9 million. The central bank's bond auction was held yet today following the yesterday's bill auction. To get a detailed update on what happened at today's auction and how would its result impact the secondary market, let's go to Netmi Fernando connecting from First Capital Holdings. The secondary market continued its lacklustre sentiment further towards today's session as investors held back owing to the inflated yield rates at the T-bond auction held today, further backed by the lingering uncertainty surrounding the market sentiment. CBSL held its LKR 75 billion T-bond auction today, the 27th of June 2024 where the total amount offered of LKR 75 billion was accepted at the auction. Furthermore, two maturities were traded at the auction today, namely 15-2-2028 and 1-6-2033, out of which 15-2-28 maturity was accepted at a weighted average yield rate of 11.90, whilst 1-6-2033 was accepted at 12.41, as yield rate surged higher. Moreover, Post T bond auction, the market continued its dull momentum as the investors opted to a cautious stance, longing for further clarity on the DDR finalization and on the uptrend movement on yields. Meanwhile, overnight liquidity witnessed a strong recovery as it was recorded at LKR 110.8 billion, slightly decreased from LKR 115.8 billion from the previous day. Gold prices fell below key levels in Asian trade today as traders remained biased towards the dollar and wary of metals before key inflation data that is likely to factor into interest rates. Spot gold fell slightly to $2,298.86 an ounce, while gold futures expiring in August fell 0.2% to $2,309.35 an ounce. Among industrial metals, copper prices were nursing losses this week amid worsening sentiment towards top importer China. Metal prices remained under pressure as the dollar rose to a near two-month high this week. Flows into the dollar were driven chiefly by anticipation of PCE price index data, which is due tomorrow. The reading is the Fed's preferred inflation gauge and is widely expected to factor into the central bank's stance on interest rates. Oil prices are falling today after a larger-than-expected build-up in U.S. oil inventories raises fears of lower U.S. demand. However, the fall will be limited by concerns about a potential widening conflict in the Middle East that could disrupt oil supplies, Reuters reports. A barrel of Brent cost $85.08 today morning, compared to $85.02 yesterday afternoon. At the same time, as of today morning, U.S. West Texas Intermediate Oil was trading at $80.69 compared to $80.73 yesterday afternoon. 
The U.S. Energy Information Administration, EIA, reported a 3.6 million barrel increase in U.S. crude oil inventories and a 2.7 million barrel increase in gasoline inventories last week, both higher than an analyst's expectations. The Sri Lankan rupee has depreciated slightly against the US dollar today compared to yesterday, according to the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. The buying rate of the US dollar has increased from 300 rupees and 52 cents to 300 rupees and 69 cents, while the selling rate has also increased from 309 rupees and 78 cents to 309 rupees and 83 cents. The rupee has largely appreciated against a basket of foreign currencies, including Gulf currencies. And let's have a look at its rates now. For a short break now, this is the Nile Business Report. Welcome back to the Nile Business Report. Dialogue Asiata PLC and Bharti Airtel Limited successfully completed the share sale transaction with Dialogue acquiring 100% of the issued shares in Bharti Airtel Lanka Limited through a share swap. Post this share swap, Asiata holds 73.75% of Dialogue, while Bharti Airtel will own 10.35% and the remaining 15.89% of shares are held by the public. Dialogue aims to amalgamate Airtel Lanka under the applicable provisions of the Companies Act, with Dialogue remaining as the amalgamated entity. This consolidation, first announced in May of 2023, represents a significant milestone in the telecommunications industry in Sri Lanka, bringing together the strengths and expertise of two leading companies, poised to deliver a world-class digital telco experience that will contribute significantly to the growth of the country's digital ecosystem and economy. Post-merger, Dialog and Airtel brands will continue to serve their respective customers, while the two networks will begin consolidation aimed at delivering exceptional value and superior connectivity solutions to consumers and enterprises. Supanvira Singh, the chief executive of Dialog Asiata PLC, said that this milestone marks the conclusion of the acquisition of Airtel Lanka, and they warmly welcome the Airtel team and all 3 million subscribers on the Airtel network to the Dialog family. He extended their heartfelt gratitude to the Government of Sri Lanka, the Telecommunications Regulatory Commission, the Board of Investment, the Colombo Stock Exchange, the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Asiata and Bharati Airtel teams and all other stakeholders for their invaluable support in bringing this transaction to fruition. He further added that as they embark on this transformative journey, their focus will be on leveraging the combined strengths of Dialogue and Airtel to pioneer advancements in Sri Lanka's telecommunications sector. Jet Holdings PLC, market leader in wood coatings and paint products and emerging regional conglomerate, recently announced the appointment of three new directors. Ajit Bandara was appointed as the Director for Research and Development, Dilshan Rajago as Director Marketing and Sharma Ravani Arachi as Country Head for Bangladesh. These additions bring a wealth of expertise and experience to their respective domains, offering strategic support to Jet Holdings' growth objectives and expansion plans. CEO Nishal Fernando stated that their exceptional skills and expertise will be vital in driving growth objectives and expanding their presence in focus markets and that they are confident that their diverse talents and proven track records will be invaluable assets as they shape the future of Jet Holdings. 
Diversified conglomerate Sunshine Holdings PLC won gold at CFA Society Sri Lanka Capital Market Awards. Held at the Cinnamon Grand Colombo recently, the prestigious gold awards was conferred for best investor relations, recognizing Sunshine Holdings' resilience and commitment to seizing opportunities and maintaining exceptional investor relations. This is the fourth time Sunshine Holdings has won the gold award in the 12-year history of Capital Market Awards. The flagship event in the CFA Society Sri Lanka calendar, this year's CFA Capital Market Awards was held under the theme of Power of Public-Private Partnerships, focusing on the current status of public-private partnerships in Sri Lanka and their future potential. Awards were presented under Best Stockbroking Research Team, Best Equity Research Report, Best Sector Research Report, Best Investor Relations, Best Unit Trust Fund and Best ESG Report reporting, with gold, silver and bronze awards in each category respectively. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the Nile Business Report. Welcome back to the Nile Business Report. Most Asian stocks fell today as technology shares tracked weakness in their U.S. peers following overwhelming guidance from chip-making major Micron. Chinese stocks saw extended losses as weak industrial profits data further sourced sentiment towards the country, while traders awaited more developments in a potential trade war with the West. Japan's Nikkei 225 shed 1.2%, while South Korea's Cosby lost 0.5%. A mix of tech weakness and China jitters saw Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index slide 1.7 percent. China's Shanghai Shenzhen CSI 300 and Shanghai Composite Indices fell 0.7 percent and 0.9 percent respectively, as data showed growth in the country's industrial profits narrowed in May. Broader Asian markets were largely negative and Australia's ASX 200 slid 1%, extending steep losses from the prior session after a hotter-than-expected inflation reading ramped up concerns over a potential interest rate hike by the Reserve Bank. Major U.S. stock indices closed with modest gains after a choppy trading session, with investors holding their cards close to the vest ahead of a presidential debate and an inflation report closely watched by Federal Reserve policymakers. Wall Street's main indexes closed with modest gains on Wednesday as investors held their cards close to their vests ahead of a presidential debate and a key inflation report. The Dow and S&P 500 both edged into the green, while the Nasdaq gained half a percent. Economic data this week includes Friday's Personal Consumption Expenditures, or PCE, price index, the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation gauge. Adam Phillips, managing director of investments at EP Wealth Advisors, said core PCE, which strips out volatile food and energy prices, should indicate the central bank is moving closer to cutting interest rates. The Fed has been projecting only one interest rate cut this year in December. But investors see a more than 50 percent chance of a rate cut in September, according to Elseg. Stocks on the move included Amazon, which rose nearly 4 percent to bring the company's market value above $2 trillion, the fifth U.S. company to cross that level. Among other mega caps, Apple rose 2 percent and Tesla gained 4.8 percent. FedEx shares jumped 15.5 percent after the delivery giant forecast fiscal 2025 profit above estimates. And shares of Whirlpool surged 17 percent after reported that German engineering group Robert Bosch is weighing a bid for the U.S. appliances maker. The yen dropped to its lowest level since 1986 against the U.S. dollar, keeping currency markets alert for any signs of intervention from Japanese authorities to boost the beleaguered currency. The yen dropped to its lowest level since 1986 against the dollar on Wednesday. The U.S. dollar traded at 160.39 yen, with Japan's currency hurt by a large interest rate gap between it and the U.S. The move alerted markets as they looked for signs of intervention from Japanese authorities to boost the struggling currency. 
Analysts said traders were testing the resolve of Japan's Ministry of Finance and Central Bank. Authorities spent $62 billion in late April and early May to support the currency when it fell past 160. Japan has already raised interest rates this year to a range of 0 to 0.1 percent. The US rates of up to 5.5 percent mean investors are flocking to the higher returns on dollar assets. That's driven up the currency versus the yen. Top currency diplomat Masato Kanda said Monday Japan was always ready to take action against excessive market moves. The traders ignored the warning after the last round of intervention did little to stop the selling. There is a chance of a further rate hike from the Bank of Japan in late July which could help support the yen. Any durable rally is likely to require Federal Reserve interest rate cuts. Friday's US Personal Consumption Expenditure Inflation Report will be key for currency markets. A lower than expected number could cause traders to raise their bets on Fed rate cuts this year. And that, in turn, could give some relief to Japan's currency. Well, that concludes today's Nightly Business Report. We'll see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings around the business globe. Until then, I'm Sina Maya Dunne and have a good night.